Nathan. Howdy. Happy to have you in the studio, man. Thanks, man. I'm stoked to be here. This place looks awesome. Uh, right, right next to the train station. Pretty rad. Good. Well, don't California my Wyoming. I know you're oh, dear a big God. Californian now, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a great place. If nobody lived there, you know, that's kind of how it works out. I was telling, I was telling some buddies. So, like, I've been doing this album, and my friend Kellen, he's like one of the people I'm the most proud of on the album because of his growth. And I went and watched him play in Casper on Friday night, and in front of everybody, he introduced me as Mr. California, and I just was like. This fucking sucks. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Really I was wondering cool. why they had a riot in Casper on Friday. Yeah, so yeah, that was me. That was my <laughs> fault. Sorry. Rest in peace to everybody who was there. Well, man, it uh, you've been up to some pretty cool things. Um, you know, Thank you. Been friends since college, and uh, man, your uh, your story and your path to where you are where you are now it's it's pretty awesome. And uh, the music and. You're working with a couple of our friends, Jordan Smith, Tris Munsick, you know, Sheridan, yeah. Sheridan Natives. They've been on the podcast before. and Yeah, know, and Sam Munsick. Sam Munsick. From, from Sheridan again. as well. Yep, and uh, I mean, the music industry and the music culture that Sheridan and Wyoming's population, or is populating now is pretty impressive, and you're kind of at the head of that. So tell us a little bit about, uh, about yourself uh, and, you know, being from Wyoming and Gillette and all, and... Uh, and uh, what you're doing now, because you, like I said, doing some pretty exciting stuff. <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I I do want to start off by saying like it seems super easy because nobody has really tapped this market, and I was just uh, I'll like I'll talk about it later. But I ended up in recording school, and COVID hit, and nobody could get any session players. Like nobody would come in, and people who even live there, their friends wouldn't come in and record. And I was like, well, shit. I know all these people in Wyoming that would lo- like would never have a chance to be in a studio where like Blink-182 was recorded, you know, and I'll bring them in here and hopefully they enjoy the experience and we can get them a good song out of it. And selfishly, it was just an excuse to like hang out and have a couple beers with my friends because I was having a really hard time making friends out there. So I was like, hey guys, I'll just bribe you with a song and I'll do all the work if you just show up and sleep on my fucking floor. That'll be awesome. But uh, yeah, I'm. I started. I started going to school in California uh, last June. So I've I've uh, I've been out there for a little over a year now. I live there with uh, my kick-ass girlfriend Julia Popish. I don't know if she'll watch this or not, but hello, you're pretty if you do. And um, yeah, so uh, she she's a vet out there, and I. We like we kind of connected when I I got pretty sick a couple of years ago. I got I got a little bit of a sore throat or cancer, and um, then I hung out with her in the hospital a bunch, and it kind of turned into like we started dating and didn't want to do the long distance thing. I was like, well, I really want to. Cancer kind of like propelled me into making my own choice. I was like, well, I can't just work construction or like be a ranch hand anymore. I need to. I need to go explore this opportunity. So I went out to California and I signed up for the most expensive place, which is super smart since rent is so cheap there. And, uh, yeah, I've, we've been there for a long time. And then my, uh, my friend Sam was playing a show tonight at black tooth, hit me up and was like, dude, you need to come to this festival at highway 30. Uh, we're playing it. It's a great time. And I'd just kind of gotten healthy and I was like, okay, well I'll go. And then we started going to that, and then I went again the next year, and I took Julia, and we met this band that I won't name because I still really like their music, but I um, had a couple beers with them, you know, wanted to want to record an EP and talk to them about that, and there was a lot of hell yeahs, and they, they said they'd do it for sure. And I told them, you know, this is going to be dirt cheap. You can stay at my house. Uh, all the recording time is free. I can get you, like, 35 hours and bank up a bunch of other students' hours. And they seemed to be very excited. And then as time went by, I couldn't get a phone call, couldn't get anything returned. And I was just, I came home all sad and told Julia, I was like, son of a bitch, like, what am I going to do? Fall musicians are like this. Like, this is going to be my life. And if I can't get anybody work for me for free, how the hell do I expect to get paid? And uh, she was like, well, if you could do anything, you know, like, what would you do? I was like, well, I would, I was like, I know some 
pretty successful people in music and like at least in my little world i was like and then i know people that deserve a little bit more success i was like i'd i'd make a compilation album of all my friends and hope that like the bigger guys look cool because they're willing to work with smaller guys and they bring some attention to it and then my buddies who don't have as many friends like fans or as healthy of a following i feel like a lot of that is because they haven't recorded in the right areas and they just don't simply don't have the money to produce something like this so i was like they could hopefully absorb everybody's fans and i just put everybody on one song too and give them a single she's like well shit do that so that's kind of where i am now and we're i'm gonna try and have the whole record out in october so the first first song that came out was uh wildcats by um colton moore and he's a Texas dude. He's been he's been there a long time. And that came out on a Monday a little while ago. And then Jordan Smith, who you guys have had on here, I mean, I've known him since I was four years old. He's he's got a very, very strong song, and that comes out Friday the thirteenth. So very excited about that. Fantastic. Yeah, and I mean the Jordan Smith song, wow. That's uh yeah. he's a talented dude and has a very unique type of sound. Um, but that's exciting, and I mean, but music hasn't been something that just you, like, oh yeah, this is kind of something I like. It's you've had a passion for music in different genres and everything for quite a while, right? Yeah, I was it. I was in a hardcore band uh, when I was like seventeen. Almost that's like why I have tattoos and stuff. I used to have really long hair. I used to steal my mom's straightener, you know, do the do the whole thing. And uh, you an emo. Yeah, everybody said it was email, but I always thought it was more like we were more of a hardcore band. Okay. Like, like our lyrics were more about like brotherhood and like hardship and shit, not like the, not cut my wrists and black my eyes sort of stuff, you know. And we didn't, we did not sing. I, I, I was a singer, but I just screamed until I'd throw up. And so I did that, and then I was in a like country kind of cover band for a couple weeks. Um, man, if my parents watch this, uh, until I got arrested and, uh, then I decided that maybe I shouldn't be in music at that capacity anymore. And, uh, I haven't been in jail for a very long time, so that's good. And, uh, but yeah, I've, I've always gone to concerts, always, always been really drawn to musicians. One of the coolest things that happened to me was my old roommate was Mike Poole. Uh, he started booking bands at the Cowboy. Now he books for Mile Zero Fest and he, he just like, started letting me hang out with these bands during the day and I made a lot of good connections that way. And then that's how I, I would take them to the mountains in Laramie or I'd take them to a bar, like whatever they wanted to do. And I always just knew that I wanted to be around music, but I was, I was also pretty content, like making 50 grand a year working construction and just kind of doing whatever I wanted on the weekends. But I started to hang out with a, a lot more musicians, a lot I like, more frequently too. And then it got to the point where these guys would call me when they come to town. And then I, I really made an effort for my friends. I would go wherever I could to watch their concerts and I just kept showing up at these things and eventually making a name for myself. I mean, I'd sell t-shirts, I'd help them roll cables. I, I'd do whatever anybody wanted. And I just never shut up and kind of weave my way in there and rejected myself into their lives. <laughs> well, that'd be, that's pretty effective and you're pretty, uh, You've uh, taken us out all on a pretty good ride at the Third Street, or yeah, you were a pretty staple at uh, at the Laramie bars. Yeah, I was probably in Laramie a little bit too long. I nah, really, no I really way. liked Mulligans and, and the Cowboy. <laughs> Going to the Cowboy tomorrow night, and, and uh, I hope I hope I survive. But it should be it should be a lot of fun. I I loved Laramie, and I, I really loved the people there too. The picture of you swinging from the rafters of the Cowboy. Yeah, is, is a legendary. One. That was like the, so. Dolly Shine. That was their <laughs> first time playing, and uh, my buddy Zach was like, he just texted me. He was like, "Holy hell, man!" He was like, "We played down here in Texas, and Texas is supposed to be wild." He's like, "He's like, you drug all your friends up in the rafters. Somebody took that picture from the crowd." He's like, "Then you tagged us." He's like, "I sent it to everybody I could," and was like, "Dude, check out this bar." And then Mike Poole, my roommate, was like, "Dude, the request." 
for these Texas bands to play are just coming in because everybody has seen these pictures. And we were like hanging off of a buffalo <laughs> upside down, you know, been at homecoming since 8 a.m., just whiskey bent. And everybody, everybody's like, you guys are so cool. And we're like, we don't even have any idea what we're doing. We don't even know who played here last yeah. night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Dolly Shine? <laughs> we have, I felt bad for those guys because the one, the one guy – his name's Zach. Uh, he came one time, and then they came the next year, and we went to this thing called Kegs and Eggs, and it was like Clark Van Hoosier from here and like Tyrell Duncan and all those guys. We went to their house to do it, and somebody played Dizzy Bat and spun around and hit her with a baseball bat right in the, like in the stomach at like 7.30 in the morning. And I was like, oh, sorry about that. And Zach was like, yeah, you guys go a little bit too hard sometimes. I was like, you woke up today and chose violence. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't do it. I want to state that for the record. I, I had nothing to do with that. I was just, I was on the roof at that time. You're just a material witness. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the common theme in Wyoming is you kind of get bored and you like to climb shit. I mean, whether it's rocks or mountains or rafters or people's roofs. I mean, we used to just sit on Clark's roof all the time. Ripping heaters. Not super smart, but it was a lot of fun. Talk about a mountain man. <laughs> yeah. Clark is the ultimate ma mountain man. Uh, and you guys have been pretty... You, how many times have you climbed, uh, climbed Cloud Peak now? Clark and I have climbed Cloud Peak three times now. And wasn't the original time that you did that, like, it was kind of... It was a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't, have to, you don't have to tiptoe around it. Yeah, it was well, terrible. Yeah, we... we it took us three days. Uh, the last day... We woke up and split a can of beans, and I hate beans. Like, hate them. We split a can of beans and a pint of beer just because it was all that we had left, and we just needed some calories. And we, we ended up getting out of there, but we were only supposed to be in there two days. Uh, I think it's like 26 miles. We turned it into about 30. We didn't bring snowshoes. Went first week of June. I didn't know it, but I definitely had cancer. And we, we just post hold for 30 miles, just kept getting lost. And then the last night we stayed there, we watched the lightning just bounce off all of the peaks. We got hailed on like three times. It, it was, it was a mess. But then now every time we go back, it gets exponentially easier. We're like, oh, hey, we know where we're going. It's August. Like <laughs> it, it tends to work out a little bit better. God, I didn't realize that first trip was such a nightmare. Yeah, it was for, it, going in the first week of June. Like, yeah, we saw the game warden in the parking lot, and he was horseback. But like in the parking lot, there was only or the trailhead. There was like two or three inches of snow. And he was like, "Oh, you guys going up to fish?" I was like, "No, we're in a summit." And he just laughed at me. He's like, "No, you're not." He's like, "Where are your snowshoes?" I was like, "I don't have any." And he's like, "You got to cross the river once to get there and once to get back. You know that, right?" And I'm like. No, I don't. We just kind of, we just kind of came up here, and I mean, we we learned that those three days, we learned we learned a lot. It, it was it was a rough time, but it was like it was also what I told Clark. Like I thanked him for it because I ended up in the hospital less than a month after that for a really long time, and I was like, dude, they keep doing all this shit to me, and. It, Hardly any of it is as hard as climbing Cloud Peak was. It was like he gave me this ridiculous mental perspective where none of this shit is hard, you know. Yeah. I was like, it's it's hard because it keeps coming. And I was there for in Denver for a hundred days, but it, so like the monotony and that it just doesn't slow down. That part is hard, but as far as like the actual physical pain and all of it, I was just like, I'm fine, you know. It wasn't too bad. And then you got hit with quarantine, literally. Yeah. Four months later. Yeah. Quarantined I'm, for 100 days then. Mm -hmm. I stayed. I stayed in the hospital, and then, like, my uh, parents were kind enough to take me in. I couldn't live by myself, and, uh, and there was just, like, too many things that could happen, and I was pretty frail. So I lived on the ranch in the basement and just watched all of Netflix. It's, it sucked ass, dude. It was It was not... Is not fun. And then it's always shameful when you're like, people are like, oh, what movie do you want to watch? You know? And I'm like, seen it, seen it, seen that whole series. Like, it's, it, I, had, I hadn't started Game of Thrones and watched all of Game of Thrones. Like, my friend Abby Royce came over and brought me some Taco John's because I wasn't fat enough. And then just continued to watch all of Game of Thrones. But yeah, I was, so I was quarantined for like two years pretty much. I wasn't supposed to go 
to a store without a mask or anything like that, which I kind of let fall by the wayside and I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to go to the gym very much. And I ended up going quite a bit. (laughs) And, um, then I, yeah, then I got to California and I was there like two months or maybe three months and I'm Irish and was all fired up to go out on St. Patrick's day and they shut down the whole city on St. Patrick's day. And it, I mean, we just, just kind of opened back up my school. Now, if you're vaccinated, we'll let you not wear a mask. And I, I don't know what that's going to look like when I go back in a couple of days, but let's I'm, not worry about that now. Yeah. Right? I'm assuming they're going to make Wyoming, us all wear a mask. That's not yeah. going to be a thing that you have to worry about until. Yeah. And thank God, man, look outside right now. It's, I've been working on my parents' ranch for this last week and it's raining really coming down i hope the l bar seven is getting that it's been it's been very painfully dry man yeah how long have uh you had that ranch or your family had that ranch over in gillette uh my dad was working in the oil field and then um my mom was teaching pe in town and my dad kind of got tired of the oil field and split the place his name's bart and then bert is his best friend they split the place uh in the i think i was like four or something when we finally moved out there so i mean to age me a little bit that's uh, that's almost three decades that he's had that place and he bought he bought another place uh north of town a few years ago kind of out by spotted horse and now and now i just in wyoming so people don't hate you i've just i tell people i'm from spotted horse instead of gillette i'm like yeah i'm from spotted horse yeah, sounds I'd good the same thing too. yeah and, and when three million people listen to this podcast L-bar seven that's yes, the name of the ranch that's the savage swag that we're rocking on set today yeah yeah we're uh i made some made some more shirts made some more hats it's been that part has been really cool wyoming is very supportive of stuff like that people always tag me on instagram and like intentionally will be like dude i'm going on this hike or whatever and they'll they'll throw a hat in their bag or a t-shirt in their bag and they're like i want to wear it at the top or whatever and that's like that's my favorite because we kind of we started that when i was sick to kind of help pay my cancer bills and everybody just showed up in such a big way i was like i can't let this thing die so i just i just kind of kept it going and there's there's a couple people just because it's like medically weird i don't want to say anybody's names but there's i mean there's a kid in cheyenne with a tumor in his face and we got to i shouldn't say it so like flippantly but he beat it and he's a badass dude um and i i I didn't feel comfortable taking people's money anymore, so I donated the some money to him, and then I donated money to a girl in Gillette who had cancer, and then uh, this cowboy I know uh, came down with a, a very devastating disease, and I got to donate some money to him. So that's been that's kind of been like the cool thing now. And I, I still have medical bills every year. Like I have a bone marrow biopsy and a PET scan and stuff and get, got to get blood work done. But it's, it's nice to like, everybody gave me so much, you know, that it's, it's really nice to as corny as it is, like give back, you know, but like what Wyoming, like kind of set me up in that way. Yeah. No, that's and, the cowboy code of ethics. That's, yeah. that's what, I mean, that's what uh, people, from around don't really understand. It's like, hey, there's a three degree separation of Wyomingites. We probably know, you know, if you say, hey, I know someone from Laramie, we probably know them, right? Yeah. And that type of, we got to spread the love, uh, mm-hmm. especially in Wyoming. So we've always been like that. That's how we grew up. That's yeah. your dad's ethics. And- that's your family ethics. Like that's the ethos of Wyoming and not just... Right, man, and you want to see... It's not, it's not, you're not a loser for giving back. Like, <laughs> just a, well, thank you. No, but, I, like, you want to see, like, some wild shit and realize how serious this is and, like, how lucky you are. It's like, go to California, and, like, they just run you in and out of that chemo ward. Dude, they do not give a shit about you. Like, my nurses in Gillette, my nurse practitioner, my oncologist, like, knew me by name. When I come in, they'd say how are you? Like half of them knew my dog's name, you know, and like know your parents and know they're like, Hey, have you been staying inside? Like you shouldn't be outside with the horses and the cows and stuff. And I'm like, yeah. And then just lying, you know? And, but like, then you go to California and they like nobody, when they told me that I was done with chemo, my doctor mispronounced my name. And I was like, dude, I've been coming to you for 
over a year and you don't even Woof. you don't even know my name and he's like hey man you're you're done with chemo like I'm really glad to give you this news Mr. Kissack and I was like okay I've corrected you on my like <laughs> which I mean I know everybody says it wrong but I'm like I've corrected you every time I come in for a month I'm like no it's just Kissick and he's like oh yeah I'll remember that I'm like no he fucking won't <laughs> and I won't ever see you again so yeah, yeah he's <laughs> go like, to I, hell buddy he, yeah he's like I hope this guy dies he's really <laughs> bummed me out and I can't get his name right <laughs> what a loser <laughs> gosh but I uh, so the the ad- you've had some serious adversity but now that you're in the profession you graduate in October yeah hopefully what uh what's been the What's been the biggest takeaway from your experience in California at this studio that, like I said, Blink-182 records there. You see uh, uh, a lot of predominant figures, and, you know, you keep that under wraps, but it's just got to be inspirational when Grammy Award winner producers and mixers and everything are working within the same realm as you. You kind of, like, you made it, right? Yeah, I mean, well... I mean, if you have twenty seven grand, you can make it. Uh, like, as any student could bump in there and like see those guys. But it does, it does definitely motivate you. And the school is for engineering. And where I've gotten really lucky is that a lot of my friends don't know the difference between an engineer and a producer. So I've been producing a lot of these songs, and they just come in and they'll hand me a cell phone. You know, like. They'll send me a voice memo demo two, three weeks before, like when they book their plane ticket and go, well, what do you think we can do with this? And then I kind of marinate on that for a while and then have them show up and I bounce some ideas off of them and try and get session players in. And then like really my only session player has been Jordan Crimson pretty much. Like I shouldn't say that because there's been like Cole Duncan and then there's this girl, Shine Benton, who sang a lot with me. And then I have this guy, Ryan Finch, and he's doing like all the bluegrass stuff. Uh, Ian Munsick's fiddle player, we've been flying him some things. Mm-hmm. He did Jordan Smith's song. He's, he's, uh, I'm supposed to get an email from him today. Actually, he's finishing up Jordan Lisko's song. Um, and, but Are you like, referring to Winton Grant? T- uh, no, it's oh. Tim. Oh, okay. Is his name? And he's like his traveling, uh, player right now oh fantastic so, yeah he messaged me he's like it's gonna be a couple days because ian's on tour right now but he did such a good job like not good that's sugarcoating it he kicked jordan like kicked jordan's ass on that song like it just sounds so good that i was like well you know this guy's pretty cheap and he's got a home studio and you can't really find country players down there i mean the dude that has recorded a bunch with me which is why this has turned out so cool is in like pop punk bands and like like mathy torp type of bands and then he just has like pop indie pop projects and stuff like that and he's been in god knows how many bands and so he's like i don't really know if that's country and i'm like well it's not perfectly country but it sounds fucking cool so we're just gonna stick with it but i think the most the most fun part about the school is like not really necessarily doing my job i've i've been i like the audio engineering stuff but as far as like patch bays and like phantom power and mic placement and like routing and auxes and stuff it's just like i don't care about it nearly as much as i should as an engineer i care more about the song how it sounds making sure somebody stays true to themselves and then pushing it and i want to force feed it to everybody like once i hear it i'm like this is so good everybody fucking needs to hear this and i'm also going to share it 27 times on instagram and like annoy you until all my friends share it and somebody listens to it well it would be annoying if you were uh, sharing a bunch of trash but yeah the, i mean well you can if the... you want to buy essential oils for me you can hit me up too okay no. <laughs> <laughs> Vanilla ones makes my house smell really nice. Yeah, I'm yeah. Hit you up for that, but that I mean your your content and your the artists you're working with are fun, and especially for me being from Wyoming. You know, I've shown uh, uh, C Dub here. I've shown him some music, and he digs it. My mom loves the Sam Riggs, um, Casey Donahue. She likes that Texas sound. I mean, country music is gonna explode, um, and I think the best part about COVID is uh, the fact that the creation and the the creativity was stifled for a year. Now guys are ready to hit the stage and put on their best show and people are ready to support them. So 
Have you seen some of that creativity or new ideas or anything? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily been stifled. I think it's just to a point where, as an artist, it's like, what the hell are you going to do? You know, you can record a whole album, but then music sales are in the shitter right now, so you can't do anything about that. And it's like, you don't want to just release a song and then not go out on tour, which is the only way you're going to make money. Yeah. So it's like, what's the point of releasing a song? So a lot of artists, I mean, the explosion of people strategically releasing stuff as COVID is starting to let up and like, I mean, all these venues are booked out so far in advance now and everybody's playing shows on Tuesdays, you know, yeah. just anything to get people out to live concerts. And it's, um, I went to, I went to a show here on, uh, was that Thursday with you? Mm -hmm. Saw Gabe and Gabriel the Bull, if anybody is listening, he's great. We watched him and just even like, just Wyoming in this tiny little brewery, I mean, there's like 75 people there and open mic night and there's like nine dudes lined up to play, you know, and I've been to that open mic night before and it's like two or three people like, uh, I don't have enough material to even play here, you know, and they're just all swapping back and forth. So it's been, I think the explosion of the music has been really, really cool and it's been, yeah, sorry, I had a burp, uh, but it's been, it's been really fun to watch and it's also been extremely fun to be a part of and I my teacher well not the teacher the owner of the school he was like he pulled me aside one day he was like we've never had one student bring the level of talent in here that you have he's like and you did it during a pandemic and I was like well Peter I'm not trying to be a dick but my friends don't give a shit about the <laughs> pandemic and he's like yeah I know you're bringing them straight from the airport here and I was like yeah, well, you're welcome yeah <laughs> what's up california <laughs> so yeah like jordan lisco i picked him up at the airport and gave him like tea right when we got there and he'd been out until like three or four in the morning and i put him in the vocal booth and he's just sweating and I, he's like i didn't realize this was gonna be so fast i was like well you had 20 minutes dude what do you want and he's like i don't know a nap i was like yeah that probably would have been smart but that like helping these guys out who I think have vision. They just don't really know where to go with it. And there's not a lot of studios in Wyoming. There's not a lot of people offering people stuff like this. And also as an engineer, a lot of people will send it to mixing or send it to mastering or whatever. And they might post something on Instagram. Like, Hey, I worked on this song, check it out if you want. And I, I just am like so proud of my friends that I can't let that shit die. And that's what I'm saying. Like I, force feed it to people i'm just like okay i i like even if i don't mix the song you know if i if i tracked it and was there i i just every single person on this album is somebody who is my friend i've known for quite a while and they're all people that i'm really proud of you know and i'm just like people need to see this and the fact that my that the studio owner who's been doing this for decades sees these guys i bring in that have like 200 followers on Instagram. He's like, what the fuck, man? He was like, well, these guys are so good. And I'm like, yeah, they just ride a horse all day or like fix fence and come up with melodies or like they're in the calving barn. And like when winter comes, there's not much to do after you feed. Let's sit around a campfire all day and write a song. And he's like, sounds like a movie. And I'm like, dude, that's just what Wyoming is. And then the other guys are from Texas, you know? And so it's, I don't have a TikTok. <laughs> to get big like some people you know <laughs> uh but yeah i don't have tiktok either i don't i don't think that i need to be famous i just want all my friends to be famous so uh instagram is about instagram and facebook is about as far as i go but um but i mean but you have a right to be passionate about the music and the projects but like on a typical song how what's your role or what are your you know you produce or mix like define like what you're doing for these artists particularly to publish their song and how long does it usually take to make a song? Yeah. I mean that, that definitely depends on like the genre and the song, but school really opened my eyes to like, I did not know how much shit happened. I was like, okay, you go to the recording studio. I thought mastering was what is called mixing. I was like, yeah, you send it to a guy, then it goes to the radio. You're famous. Like, that's how it works. And then you get there and there's like, you have your tracking engineer, you have your mixing engineer, you have your mastering engineer. And then like you have live sound engineers. And then some bands get so big that like your job could just be to be the engineer for the monitors on the stage. Like it, there's so much more that goes into it. But what the part that I really like is the tracking engineer part. I 
suck at mixing and my buddy Jordan is very, very talented at it. And it, he's just light years ahead of me. And I'm like, well, I can send my friends to this guy. I feel very confident what he's doing. He doesn't charge very much money. And I'm like, I feel okay with that. I, I, I like to be in the studio for it. But I mean, I will get a demo from somebody a couple weeks before. They'll send me a chord chart. I will show it to a session player and then as they show up we try and write guitar parts while the artist is in town because that's kind of where the song it like originates and then I'm like okay if you like the guitar parts you can trust me with the rest of the shit and I will just bounce them stuff but all of this is I'm hindered because I'm only allowed in the studio six hours a week like if you had a real recording studio and you had a paying client you could you could track a song in a day pretty easy but we're like you know we have people who our session players are free so it takes a lot a little bit longer i'm an audio engineer who has done it for a year so i'm a little bit slow like a lot of these guys it's their, their first time in a recording studio or they only have like an ep or something like one guy didn't know what a click track was like so there's there's a lot of those hurdles that make it to where i was like confidently telling all my friends i'm like dude this shit will be out in june like you can tour on it in the summer there's two guys on the album maybe three now that i haven't even gotten songs from but colton released his song pretty quick and i was like well thanks for the pressure and jordan wants his ep to come out and he should he worked really we all worked really hard on it but like it's gonna be really good and um he deserves to have it come out but like he wants it to come out soon and so it's and like we're trying to have all this stuff released so i'm doing a lot more than an engineer normally would yeah. you know like i've got all these people i'm trying to release everybody's stuff like when they're touring and have it help out their ep and stuff so that part i, I realized i just went on a tangent i mean it could take anywhere between when i when we like mix and have somebody record and then have session players and then i've been lining up session players to where i'm like okay we're gonna do all the guitars on all these tracks or like then we're gonna do all the bass on everything or we'll do drums for everything today and so some of the guys who started early like there's like a jordan lisco and like the Munsics came out there pretty quick and like their stuff is still kind of at the same stage as everybody else's, even though they're out there earlier. So, I mean, for me right now, not owning a recording studio and only having access to it six hours a week, it takes months. I can imagine. Yeah. That's a very limiting factor. Yeah. And before we came to the end of the school year, like I could just ask kids, you know, like, Hey, are you using your hours this week? And a lot of them are like, Younger people, they're not really taking advantage of this opportunity. And they're like, yeah, dude, have my hours. I don't care. Like, write my name on the sheet. You have to be in there 24 hours a quarter. And there are some students that are like, oh, shit, I need to get my 24th hour. And I'm like, dude, I got that in two weeks, you know? Like, I get in there as much as I can because it's such a foreign space to me. And I, I really, I don't know when I'm going to have an opportunity to be in a room like that ever again. Yeah. So I'm like, I need to use this shit as much as I possibly can. And, but now I, everybody was giving me their hours and now they're like, I'm like, Hey man, can I have your hours? And I'm like, no, actually I think you should give me your hours. Cause you were taking all of them at the beginning of the year. And I'm like, I'm not giving you not my fucking happen. hours, dude. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Amnesia. Yeah. yeah. What's um, your name? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chemo brain, bro. Yeah. I don't, sorry, I bud. can't remember anything. <laughs> Feel bad for me. I had cancer. Yeah. But <laughs> that yeah. you just go to every time. <laughs> yeah. So screwed up. Yeah. 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 I try not to use it very much, but there are times when I'm just like, well, if this gets me another day or something, I'm, I might use it. <laughs> you totally use it. You have a pass. Yeah. A pass. Yeah. I guess so. Well, and then, I mean, and the benefits of all these would be the relationships you have with some of these artists that are just for, you know, they are kicking ass. Yeah. You know, and I didn't, uh, I saw Shine Frontier Days, for example, was like the most successful it's ever been. Awesome. And we have some, we had some local talent and stuff, but artists are really coming into their heyday right now. And you get to enjoy that. You get to go to those concerts. What's that? What was the Highway 30? Yeah, that, Highway that, 30. There was a bunch of different artists then. Right? Yeah, I mean, there's tons of bands that play there. And then I would like to, well, Sam's going to come on here eventually. Oh, hell but yeah. he's, he's right back there. He's got to make that number two TikTok. He made me. He made me he's got that second TikTok. <clears throat> Sam made me fucking cry at the music festival. It was, I don't know if it was that or the vape pen, but he had told me, 
He had told me on the river, he was like, hey, man, I'm going to headline this thing next year. And I, I like, I know where he started out at and how, like, he does a bunch of extra stuff for that festival. He'll, like, sit on a stool and play acoustic and then, like, talk about his charity and stuff like that. And then he goes back for, like, the festival owner's birthday. And it's like, you see how hard he's worked to do that shit. And you have to fucking go do that stuff. It, because this, unless you're just, like, a huge guy, this stuff is not going to get handed to you. He's played the festival, like, s at least six years. And so... He took me. He took me to that festival, and then he tells. We, he decided we were gonna whitewater raft, and we went. And he was like, "Hey, man, I'm gonna headline the festival next year." And I was like, "To me, it didn't really seem like news." I was like, "Well, I think he could have done it last year, but like the new album's doing really good." And I was like, "Well, fuck, you deserve it. Like, that's fine." And then I was in the back of the crowd, and I, the guy who owns a festival, his name's Gordy, and he's like. He's crazy, dude. He's incredibly nice, but, like, has to go on vocal rest. He gets so excited. He just stands on the side of the stage and screams and waves his cowboy hat. He, like, he loves that type of music, and he picks bands very tactfully. It's, like, what he wants to do. And so I'm standing in the back, and I see Gordy walk up on stage, and I'm like, I know what they're going to do. They're going to announce that Sam's going to headline this thing next year. And Gordy just in front of everybody, he's like, I think you should headline this motherfucker. And I just, like, I had sunglasses on, and I'm screaming, dude. I was like, let's fucking go. <laughs> let's go. And, like, and Julia's like, okay. It's staring at me all weird. <laughs> and then I looked at her, and she was like, what's wrong? And I was like, I'm shit i'm crying and she's like she's like that's fine you're feeling a lot of things and i was like yeah it was the last day i was like we'd been up pretty late and went rafting and like been to been to zion like the day before and we we hadn't been sleeping very much and i was, i i've been friends with sam for a long time so i was just i was really really proud of him and i mean there a festival gets bigger every year when you see it, it's it's been it's been really exciting to see. Where does that festival take place at? That happens in Filer. I I don't know how many people watch this thing, but like if you don't go to Highway Thirty Music Fest, you've completely lost your mind. You can show up as the band starts and be in like the eighth row every day. A lot of people just kind of it's kind of like in the the attendance is a little bit older. So like people just will like hang out in a chair and just drink beer. But like, if you want to go and get rowdy and stand in the front row, it's not that hard. It's not like a regular festival where you got to get there a day in advance, you know? And like you show up at 9am when the first band plays at three and you just like piss in the dirt and hope that you get to see them. Like it's, it, you can, you can be right in it all day and they'll go until like midnight and, Bands will start pretty early. Tickets are incredibly reasonable. The like camping is really cheap. Or if you want to like, we stayed in like a little cracked in Motel Six for like fifty five dollars a night. Like it's it's a very affordable trip. And if you get your tickets early, like even if you don't get them early, it's it, if you get them early. I did the math at one point, and it was like four dollars a band to go to this festival. Good lord. Yeah, and they they keep adding bands. They they added another day this year, and so now this thing starts on Wednesday, goes all the way through Saturday night, and then Sam's gonna headline the bit like the main night. It'll be Saturday night, so it's really when everybody shows up. So we'll definitely have to link the information to that because it'd be a hell of a show, especially if you're headlining it. Yeah, Highway Thirty is a blast. That's fantastic. Well, I mean, I think it's time that you should interview. The man of the hour, the guy that's putting on a show at Black Tooth Brewery tonight. Hello, Nathan Kissick. Howdy. Howdy. Nice to meet you. Yeah, so uh, I don't know who's interviewing here. I guess we should shoot the shit. Okay, I'm down to shoot some shit. How did we meet? Uh, See, we've, we've, uh, we've, we've argued about that. And I feel like we met before. I feel like we met. Did we meet in Montana and then again in Stephenville? I mean, we met... I thought we met in Denver. Denver, that's where it was. And then, because, like, I was outside smoking, and Outrun the Sun had come out not too long ago. Oh, dude, that's right. And I was excited, and I was broke as shit and didn't have money to go to Music Fest, and you were with Mike Ryan, and mm -hmm. you were riding back with them, but you were playing acoustic shows. Yeah. And then you were like, hey, man, if they, like, saw me outside, I was like, are you Sam Riggs? And he's like, you're like yeah. And I was like, eh. I was like, cool, man, I'm, I'm really excited or whatever, and you, you've just, like... I had your fucking bumper sticker on my car like an idiot. And uh, I was like, I was like, well, I've, I really like this guy or whatever. And then you were like, man, if you know anybody that could come to this show, that would be great. And I was like, 
Uh, we ran in a van. There's eight of us here. And <laughs> Sam was like, damn, there's like 15 people here total, you know? Yeah, we were on tour on the snow drifts and ski lifts tour that Mike and I were doing. And it was like, so we had just done a shit job of promoting it. It was January. No one was like back spending money after the holidays. A lot of people were at Music Fest and Steamboat. There was just a lot going on while we were trying to pull this off in the middle of uh, the freaking snow-covered highways of, you know, Colorado and Kansas and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, that's where we met. It was a snow drifts and ski lifts tour. Yeah, and then we we ended up at a, a place of ill repute after that. Mm -hmm. And then it was like I was seeing a girl in Texas, and I saw you there at oh, Party wait, in the Pasture. Wait, wait, wait. It were was that Diamond did, Cabaret? Did I get kicked out that night? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, I it's it all would, coming back to me. It would be like really hard. It would be really hard to tell truthfully what happened because I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure I got thrown out of the strip club that night. Yeah, well, and it was not for doing anything like bad. I think I was just being. I think I was just being wild. Well, you were full of piss and vinegar then. You were younger. Yeah, I was younger. I was, that was, what, six, seven years ago? Yeah, somewhere in there. Like, it always pops up on my Facebook. Like, I, I know who was there. Trey Wasberger was there. Cody Anderson was there. Jake Johnson was there. Brett Berry was there. So, with that crowd, I mean, <clears throat> we could have gotten kicked out of Walmart. Yeah. No, that's true. That's hundred percent sure. I'm pretty sure we tried to go to two strip clubs, and we didn't, <laughs> we didn't even get in the front door of the first one because I cut in line. Oh. And then we got, we did. They wouldn't even let us in the door. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I but I would say, I would say when we really met was like so we had met in passing at these things, getting drunk and stuff and just being wild. But then like we kind of grew up at the same time. Like yep. tried to get our shit together. Same age. Yeah, and then it was just like you were coming to Laramie, and I was like, hey man, I'm seeing you're doing all this outdoorsy shit. Like we don't need to go get hammered at the Buckhorn at eight in the morning. Like. Would you like to go do this? And you're like, fuck yeah. And just immediately, I messaged, 100%. I DM'd you like twice. And then you're like, fuck this dude. Here's my phone number. Yeah. And you gave me your phone number. And then we just started texting and I just went and picked you up. And yeah. Up. He was like, do you want to go climb Medicine Bow? And I was like, yes. I had no idea we were climbing a 12,000 foot peak, <laughs> but we. Almost 13,000. We like rolled up into uh, the Wind River Range. It's in the Wind River Range. No, it's no, in the snowy. It's in the snowy. Okay. Yeah. And so we rolled up in there beautiful part of uh of the country and we uh neither of us had sunscreen didn't really give a fuck and we just start like bombing this hill and we had nightlinger your lab mm -hmm. with us and yeah we climb up to the top and it was freaking awesome and i checked my phone um i think i busted out snapchat uh back when i had it and i had the altitude thing on it which was actually pretty accurate surprisingly yeah and it said like twelve thousand and change i was like dude <laughs> yeah yeah <clears throat> and then we glissaded down this like snow covered thing and nightlinger almost ate me that was and the day that i found out what that word meant yeah i was like i don't even he was like are we gonna glissade down this thing i was like glissade. i was like i'm gonna slide down this thing on my ass it's a mountaineering term he's like I, yeah I dude that's what it is i was yeah. like oh, okay well you church this shit up quite yeah. a bit i, I I'm in athletic, like in Nikes and tennis but shoes. But don't let him play it down. You're, you're coming down like a 50 degree slope of snow and ice that's packed down after like being melted and frozen and melted and frozen in the springtime. And then there's like a 200 foot drop, uh, like cliff that you have to stop before you get to the to the end of it. So the and when you get to the bottom, you know you're like Santa Claus on crack trying to stop the sleigh, dude. You're just digging yeah. your heels in, and and then Nightlinger's trying to eat my face while I was doing it. Yeah, I don't know why <laughs> Nightlinger got very excited for some reason. That's how he shows love. I just, I just, I just hugged Nightlinger and kissed him goodbye today. Oh man, I so, love that dog. I haven't seen him. I haven't seen him since that day. He's a little gray around the mouth now, and he's Is taking it? care of a little puppy. So yeah, he's, I saw a little puppy. He's on his last. He's like this son of a. Bitch. <laughs> he gonna be the death. Yeah, I just looks at him. He's like, damn it. So we go from <clears> mountain <throat> climbing to, to it was it was like that Spider Man meme because we ended up having so much in common. It was like, wait a minute, you like mountaineering wait a minute you like rock music <laughs> pop punk yeah do you like a day to remember <laughs> do you want to go see a day to remember oh my god i'll never forget that so we go we get tickets to go see a day to remember in denver because it's like a halfway point between us and the, the reason i was in denver do you remember because he was getting you're getting treatment for cancer no i was getting a bone marrow biopsy that's right yeah even bone worse <laughs> and he, we go to this a day to remember concert which is like the circle pit i'm pretty sure i cracked a rib and our friend taylor lost a shoe uh, but Nathan has this port 
in his back. Just, it's, a, it's a pressure bandage. Yeah, yeah, on top of a hole in his lower back. And I've got a picture of it, of him like, with his a hole in my shirt spine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're just at this metal concert, just like giving her hell. Oh, yeah. Yeah, full on. It was Beartooth, uh, I Prevail. I Prevail. Day yeah. to Remember. The, I think that was it. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, it, it was, was wild. It was a dope show. The lineup, the lineup was awesome. So then we go from there to... I don't know, just so many, uh, like, canyoneering, Moab. Yeah, we went to Moab, and then we had been, like, we'd been, he was, like, he took me out to, like, celebrate being, like, cancer-free, and when I was healthy enough, we did that, and then a year later, I was off chemo, so I was like, well, shit, he hit me up, and I was like, might as well do it again, we went on the Suffer Fest, and uh, <laughs> yeah. it was just, but and then we went, to, but like we'd been we'd been in talks, like we'd been friends at that point long enough that we were in talks of like going to South America to climb oh, this mountain. Kagua, yeah, yeah, we were gonna climb Aconcagua, and I was like, "Fuck, dude, I'm pretty far in over my head here. At least this guy's six foot nine. Like, he's gonna have to carry my <laughs> hobbit ass up this mountain." And then uh, we we met each other again in Montana. Did this very chill little hike, and I was just like drenched in sweat afterwards. Yeah, drank quite a bit with uh, with one of our friends, Maddie. Yo, Mad afterwards. Dog Maddie. Yeah, and then um, I went home. I was in the hospital in like a week. <laughs> yeah, but it I, was bad news. But I found out that I couldn't do Aconcagua, but it was. Like they were like, you're in really great shape, you know? And I had like these little fibers growing in my lungs that are supposed to stop when you're 16. Like your lungs are supposed to stop expanding at a certain age. And it was because I was so terrified that Sam was just going to punish me on this mountain. He was like, dude, I'm going to like take care of you, you know, and like help you out with money on it and stuff. And I was like, okay. So I was just like, I can't show up to this fucking thing and be the reason we don't make it to the top. So I've been I've been lunging like a half a mile at least a day. I've been doing hit training and I've been lifting weights. Then I had been on the stair climber for an hour, three or four times a week, like at a time. Yeah. And so he was doing more than I was. <laughs> and I, didn't, I didn't realize that they're like I was like, man, I feel like such a bitch. And what was happening was my lung was slowly collapsing because I had all this serous fluid just pushing on it. So by the time I got to the hospital, my lung was functioning at like less than 10% and they pulled two liters of fluid off of it. But they were like, you're in great shape. And that's like the chemo that I got. They're like, once you get 30, you're not even supposed to be able to get this. Like, uh, but you're in such good shape. Like if you want to sign this paper, it says you won't hold the hospital liable. If you die, then we'll let you have it. And I was like, will it cut down the time I'm in the hospital? And they're like, yeah, it'll cut it down. It's going to be way harder. I'm like, where's the pen? Yeah. yeah. Just, just give me that thing. Dude, Took enough chemo to take down a <clears throat> horse. Yeah. Big horse. Yeah. And I was not a big man. It was, that was wild. But you came and saw me. He came and saw me in the hospital. The nurses thought I was famous. And I was like, I was like, I'm on Medicaid. If you like, you guys know that, right? Like, I'm not famous. But they were like, you're not telling us your real name because we we think you're somebody. And yeah. like, musicians are coming in here and playing the Grizzly Rose and stuff and like stopping in. And I was like, no, these are just my friends. Like, <laughs> I, I'm I'm not famous at all. Nathan was being a good boy. I took all the edibles that people brought for him and watched a river runs runs through it. And I had such a good time. It was just my, it was just one of the nurse's birthdays. And I was talking to her on the phone. She just cussed me out. And she said that night they like, they came in and I, he's, he didn't eat all of them. It didn't take me very many. So, oh, so I can, we yeah. can say it now that yeah. you took some? Okay. Yeah. I was all like, right. I mean, even my mom knows. So it's like, all right, all right, whatever. All right. Fair enough. Um, must be nice to touch the floor. I feel like Kevin Hart over here. <laughs> Foot swinging. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I was like, she took my, uh, blood pressure and it was so low and my heartbeat was so low. She was like, oh shit, this guy's trying to die on us. Like, she was like, your heart rate should be way, way more elevated than that. Blah, blah, blah. She's like, you're basically sleeping awake. So they were doing all these expensive blood tests on me trying to figure out what was wrong. And it's I was high. just baked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, dude, yeah, I had like my, um, I better not say it. He's kind of like a big member in his community, but I had a guy bringing me stuff all the time. Dude, I, I've never, I've seen the river into it 15 times and I, dude, I got so much more out of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> But There's yeah, that was in there trying not to cry. We're like, damn, this is dude, actually that was a hell of an experience. Man, I remember like, yeah, that was crazy, dude. You look like 
if you were to put a picture of Nathan up when he was in the hospital versus now versus before, those are three different people. Yeah, that's you, true. Like before, he's, they call him the hobo with a shotgun. That was his IG handle. And he, like, <laughs> he had this long hair and like just a wild ass and uh, still is. But then he got cancer and he became this like Simpsons character. <laughs> and then. <laughs> Now he's like in the best shape of his life, and it's like, dude. But those three people, it's like they they they're all the same people, but they don't look the same. It's crazy. Yeah, I can barely get on a plane still because my driver's license is from the hobo with the shotgun days. And oh yeah, just like take your mask off, like, take your hat off, <laughs> take smile. your shirt off, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> take your pants off. <clears throat> yeah, dude. it was. I don't know. It was it was a very it was a very interesting time for sure. Yeah. So he's talking about the Suffer Fest. So the Suffer Fest was uh was Wait, like, we should cut you off because you do Sam runs like a charity for mental well being where you use nature and like the outdoors and isolation to yeah. bring yourself out of the depths of like depression or drug abuse or any sort of anxiety problems that you're having. It's called the Air and Opportunity Adventure Company. Yeah, we're wearing our own shirts yeah. here. We should have swapped, but yeah. I don't think you can wear a girl small. Yeah. Yeah, and I uh yeah, I started this company basically because it was a huge part of me overcoming my own uh addictions and depression and stuff like that. I feel like the outdoors is just like incredible for that. And um so yeah, I started this. Nathan was a guinea pig for me to try out like all these different crazy canyons and trips and stuff like that and he he embarked on some crazy journeys with me and we did so I, I have this thing called the incredible journey that basically you hike into the desert a few miles and you rappel down like 300 feet down into the green river um and then you blow up a pack raft and you and you raft down the river for two days also the first time he took me out i'd never rappelled in like not a ropes course <laughs> i put him on and 197 he dropped, he dropped me it was like 200 feet yeah it's and he's feet. just like I was like, what? I was like, my feet are on the wall. What do I do? And he's like, you're free rappelling. I was like, that would have been fucking cool. No, before. And then you're like so deep into a slot canyon that you can't possibly get out. So There's only like, one way out. Yeah, I was like, so I sit here and starve to death, or do I risk it? And then, it was just us two. So I didn't. Need, he had to run the ropes because if I would have ran him, we both would have died. So he's like, yeah, dude, you got to go down first. So I didn't get to see anybody do it. I am deathly afraid of heights. And I'm, so I'm just sitting there, just trembling. He's like, sit down, dude. Sit in the seat. And it's like, you're 200 feet high in the air, and you're supposed to just sit yeah. in the air. <laughs> it's like, not very intuitive to yeah, back over like, a 200-foot no. cliff. But you did so good. Sort of. You it did so good. took me a minute. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. So to see your story unwind um, as, like, kind of, like, as Nathan was going through, I don't know, what I would deem probably the most, like, fascinating four years of your life. Um yeah. There's been these trips that have sort of happened off and on through that time. And so it's kind of been these cool moments to sort of check in and watch your progress. And I've got to say, man, like if, to see the ground that you've covered, the mountains that you've climbed literally and metaphorically, dude, it's stunning. And, and the thing of it is, is like, you'd never know that. Like just if you met Nathan in a bar, he'd talk cows and shop and shoot the shit, maybe talk about rock music. And you'd never know that he beat cancer, climbed mountains, you know, has like overcome so many different fears as an incredible friend, you know, brother, son, and also is awesome to his girlfriend. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I feel like the world's lucky to have Nathan Kissick. And, and that's, Whoa. that's my dick sucking for today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. I'm going to write a book. It's going to be the beginning. It's going to be the start. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's, it is it is very cool though to have a homie that's like, hey, like we're gonna get like I'm gonna get a tattoo today, or like here's the song link, mm -hmm. you know, or like. But you you treat me like you're like I'll send him a song and he'd be like, meh, I've heard better. <laughs> and it's like I'm like, what the fuck, really? He's like, do you want a, you want a yes man or you want the real shit? And I'm just like, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah I'm like, dude, so. everybody's gonna tell you the song's great, but don't you think you should know before you can put it out to the masses they yeah. could be a little better but then i sent him like uh, the demo for until my heart stops beating he was like let's go <laughs> yeah. i freaked out over that i had to download dropbox i was in a skid steer moving cow shit <laughs> didn't have enough like lte or whatever i'm still not good with technology but like i had to go back to the house and get wi-fi to download dropbox then to download that and i just listened to that song like 20 times cleaning <laughs> cow shit out of a pen 
and just like air guitaring a pitchfork like a redneck. But what I was gonna say, what's cool is to have Sam just be like, he knows that I will because I'm just I'm always like, the power of almost dying is pretty epic because you're just like, okay, well. I don't really like to tell people no anymore. If it's something that I think I want to do, it's like, do you have the money? Do you have the time? It's like, definitely fucking not, but I'm going to do it. So he just hit me up like, it was just like 18 hours at this point. He's like, hey man, I want to do this, this epic trip where we like drop into the canyon and float out. And he's like, we'll just repel off this cliff ridge. Nobody's ever done it. And I was like, okay, sick. Like, when do I have to be there? And he's like, uh, Thursday afternoon. It's like Wednesday at noon. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay, I look it up. It's 14 hours to drive. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to leave tomorrow morning at 2 a.m. And he's like, well, I could fly you out. And I was like, no, dude, you've done too much. Like, I'm just going to drive. So I say you've done too much. It's steal my girlfriend's car. And drive <laughs> yeah, out. He takes his girl's car. And yeah. Out. Like, well, dude, that they, I mean, I got there for like $42. It's 80 miles a gallon. Yeah. Yeah, so we get there, and it, it was a first descent, and it was um, is interesting because pack rafts, you know, you're not like dry; you're in, you're kind of sitting in the water, and um, we're paddling out, and we had a uh, we had Trevor, this guy Trevor, with us shooting it on camera and kind of filming the, the whole experience, and it kicked it kicked all of our asses. We had a headwind a lot of times going down the canyon. We had um, low water, low water. We we bumping our asses on sandbars half the time. But I feel like in my personal opinion, like when you, when, if an adventure goes smooth and everything goes to plan, it's not really an adventure. It's just a trip. Right. So going and having these like hardships and then like setting up camp and like making a fire and talking, you know, telling stories, seeing alien spacecraft in the middle of the night. <laughs> no shit. We're like, we're laying there in the Canyon bottom and we're, we got, we don't even have tents. We're just laid out on sleeping pads and sleeping bags. And I'm talking to Nathan. <laughs> it's like, there's three feet between us, but I'm like sitting like here, like we're in bed and I'm like leaned over and I'm like, looking at him talking. Hi, what are you doing? Over his shoulder comes this string of lights in the sky. And, and I just listened to the alien podcast. We were Rogan just on the talking way about out aliens. There. I was we, like, I don't want to fucking play anymore. We were talking about how like Utah and like that part of the world has so much like, you know, the skinwalker stories and like the aliens and all this kind of crazy stuff. And here comes a string of lights. And I'm like, Nathan, what is that? He's like, what is what is that <laughs> and he looks over and there's like no shit and we found out it was a military exercise mm-hmm. but it was a string of lights in the sky low altitude and you could just see where the canyon dropped down like this and they on were just, a grid too yeah like they were just perfect, perfect dude. just going like that across the sky and, and then, then as been, they got closer we realized they were in pairs we thought there were seven planes yeah. and there were 14 no there was a, there was it, close to 100 there ended up well they came in like chunks. Yeah, yeah yeah they came in chunks but yeah there was like, yeah, seven seven pairs of fourteen, and they can't like, and there was like, I don't know, like six groups of those, seven groups of those, and anyway, we we once we calmed down, and realized we didn't think it was aliens. We went to bed, and woke up the next morning. We paddled the rest of the way out, and then part of this trip though is I I staged my plane. Like I got a little one eighty two backcountry plane, and I put it down at the Mineral Bottom Airstrip, which is right on the Green River. And so we pulled out of the river and loaded all our, our shit into the plane and we take off at the hottest part of the day, which high altitude, hot days, it's dangerous taking off out of there. So I had to make two trips. I took them back separately because I didn't want to chance it. So we take off out of the canyon and, you know, we're boom, buzzing it and flying the canyon, you know, 20 feet off the water, just like following the canyon and climb out. And it was like, he's a real asshole, dude, dude, I don't like, I don't awesome. like heights. I don't, I don't like heights. I don't like planes. I don't really like the heat. I have no fucking clue why I go on any of these trips. Dude, it was so epic yeah. though. <laughs> Every time I get so there, I'm epic. just like, son of a bitch. I'm going to be here for three days. Yeah. All right. And now I'm always trying to get my girlfriend to come. And she's like, that sounds terrible. Did you even have fun? I was like, no, I had a blast. And she's like, no, what you described to me did not sound fun. I'm going to (laughs) say. Poor Trevor. He was was like, dude, we wore that kid out. (laughs) Well, I told them I saw him at the, I saw him at the music festival. And he was like, he was like, dude, well, like physically. Cheers. Cheers. To Wyoming. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, like physically, oh dear God, you just did it, huh? Well, it's aged 12 years. <laughs> not anymore, it's not. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he was like, he was like, yeah, man. I mean, he was, 
He's like, physically, clearly, it kicked my ass. He's like, but no cell phone, no computer. He's like, out there on a river all by myself, just struggling. He's like, I, I didn't fucking like that. And I was like, well, that's the point. That's it's supposed to like <clears throat> take you t- through a mental, like, I don't know. It's a mental charade. It, t- it, it teaches you about ego. Because if there's, dude, the, the mountains and the canyons are the ultimate equalizer, dude. It will yeah. bring you to your knees. Mm-hmm. You think you're badass? If I ever start thinking I'm badass, I always start planning a trip. It always brings me you back. You're going to learn today. You're going to learn today. <laughs> of all the trips you've taken, what has your guys' favorite trip been? Not necessarily together. No. No. Whatever okay. you like. Just in life. Go ahead. Oh, shit. So you can think about yours and yours can be all poignant and you can look smart. Um, well, I could go first. Yeah, do that, because I'm stuck between Iceland and <clears throat> something else. So I've taken some pretty incredible trips. Um, I've been all over the world uh, to 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 New Zealand, Iceland, France, UK, Shout out South America. Yeah, made my son, my, my wife Rachel, and I made our kid in New Zealand <laughs> unexpectedly. <laughs> Rook, what an incredible kid. Um, <clears throat> and I got to say, like, all of those places are absolutely just incredible, but it's the places where, like, it's the shitty trips. It's the ones that, like, I met my match as far as, like, challenge goes and – that's that is where I find have found myself. There's one that comes in particular that comes to mind in Utah, but probably the story that I should tell is about Aconcagua. And I went to Aconcagua, the trip that Nate was supposed to go on, but he ended up getting cancer. Dick, I really pissed. Uh, <laughs> I pissed out, dude. I should have went. Yeah, and uh, I failed. I almost died. On that mountain. I was, I had been on tour. I was in the middle of divorce. I was full of heartache, physically exhausted, um, was still riding out, getting clean. Um, and it was a really hard time in my life, but I went for it anyway. And I, I, my heart was ready in some ways, but my mind and my body were not. And I made it to a little, uh, over 17,000 feet on that mountain. And my body just started to shut down. I had bad acute mountain sickness. I had climbed really fast with some Nepalese climbers. um, And it had just like, it just kicked my ass. And I started to like, my vision started to black out every time my heart would beat. And I had the onset of what's called HACE, high altitude cerebral edema. And it's where your brain starts to swell. And from lack of oxygen, it's, um, it's a stress response. And so I, and my and I also realized that I couldn't feel anything from my calves down, and I lost all the toenails. I had a real bad frost nip on my feet. Um, so I I go down the mountain and I take a spill because it's like walking with like your feet, your legs asleep. And I and I take a spill and I fall and I twist my knee out of hell and it ends up I can't get off the mountain. Um, but I'm at base camp at fourteen thousand feet and I'm just miserable. And you know, Leonardo, one of the the photographer that was on the trip, I, he and I became steadfast friends and he came down, he came to my tent and he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm, I'm trying to radio for a helicopter so that I can get off the mountain. We're trying to figure that out. And, uh, I said, I just feel so defeated. I feel like I came here to do this and, and, and I just, I, f- I feel like I just fucked up, man. Like I just, I don't, I shouldn't even be here. And I've never failed on a mountain before. And he says, my friend, we come to the mountain to set our priorities straight. And what do you want to do when you go home? I said, I just want to go home and figure my life out. I want to fix my heart. I want to fix my head. He said, then you came to do, you did what you came to do. The mountain has served its purpose. You weren't meant to climb it. You were meant to figure that out. And that sort of like started to set things on the mend in my heart. The helicopter came two days later. I was able to get off the mountain. It would, it, they were delayed due to high winds, but I couldn't walk off. It was 18 miles out, and I just couldn't, my leg, my knee couldn't take it. But on the way out, I just remember thinking how badass it was to like be in a helicopter in the mountains. Like, this is cool. And I was already a fixed-wing pilot, and I was like, man, I want to learn, at least try to learn how to fly a helicopter. So when I got signed off by my doctor to go back to flying, I called the local fly school, and I said, hey, I want to, book a flight just to learn to take a helicopter lesson and they said okay that sounds good we'll put you with Rachel and I said all right and uh 
and yeah, I can remember stepping into the office and sitting down and she came in from the hangar and it was like out of a movie Damn. door opens, wind blows in. She fixing her hair from being out there is beautiful blonde woman. And she sits down and she says, hi, I'm Rachel. And if we, in that handshake, we could have seen <laughs> what would have happened over the next two and a half years. It would have, I mean, it was like something out of a movie and she became the love of my life and the mother of my child. What the fuck? I should have went first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say. Like, like, okay, so I already told the story with me and Clark, which is probably my favorite one. Are we still good? Yeah. You, you already swapped him? T- tell, yeah. You bad going. bitch, you. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I already told the Clark one. I feel like Clark was, it's like one of those things where you say, you know, like, you need shit to go wrong. And I mean, if I'm eating beans at seven in the morning, some shit has gone very wrong. Eating beans and drinking beer. Dude, that's some John Wayne shit right there, dude. I I mean, (laughs) I I can't tell you how much I hate beans and IPA and it's what I woke up to. Oh my God. Kill me. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that was, uh, it's, it's like one of my favorite trips to look back on because it was just so fucked the whole time. (laughs) And we had a laugh about it and we've taken, um, we've taken two people on it now and we, two different people, we were going to try and take you this year if you had time, but you've ended up not like you just got here today. But I was like, like, it's so impossible to tell them what happened. Cause you go in August and they're like, well, yeah, there's a little bit of snow up here. I'm like, no, you have no you in June. clue. Yeah. First week of June. <clears throat> Cause it's hot everywhere else except up there. Yeah, 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 and then like or to warming just, up to have the thunderstorms just roll in, you know. I can remember he had a spot of service on the mountain, and I just get this random pic, and he, we it's like we both got iPhones, and it came in on a text message, and it's just Nathan huddled under a tent with <laughs> hail everywhere. <laughs> it wasn't even a tent; it was a tarp. Yeah, we just had Clark's tarp, dude. And yeah. my dog, my poor dog, he's looking at us. He's like, Fuck "Nightlinger, you guys." He was in the tent. That's why he's all gray mouth. Yeah, he's he's in the <laughs> tent, just like, dude, I'm gonna freak out. Out. I don't know. It, like, it's hard to nail down a trip because there are aspects of everything that I like. Tell me I, the story. Tell me this. Tell me the story about how you paddled the Green River backwards. <laughs> it's not backwards if it works. I was going <laughs> faster than the long the the guy, dude who was longer than I was yeah. in height. He, Nathan keeps. Pa- I keep looking back, and Nathan and, or ahead. We're just like all over the river, and Nathan is paddling backwards down the river. Instead of going like like this, I'm just like, but dude, you're used. I work out a lot and I just wanted to use a different (laughs) muscle group. I was like, okay, like instead of going like this the entire time, I'm going to start using my like lats and stuff and my shoulders to push myself back. So I just flipped the raft around and paddle backwards. And I was just, at first, I was trying to hide it, and then by the end, I was like, I don't care what anybody says. I think the truth of like why it was easier, what one of the reasons it was easier to do that, it was because you have your pack and shit all on your feet, and so the front of the raft is sitting further down in the water, and the current carries a lighter into the raft around, and he, but like I kept being like Nathan, just turn around, you'll have more control. And like, I wasn't having any control. The raft he was wasn't, so the raft dude, was, he was so bad, light like, that every time I would take one stroke I like, right, I would just go Sabor. sideways. <laughs> Sideways, sideways. I'm like, no, fuck this. I'm turning around, dude. I remember, I remember looking back, and Trevor's just like, just out of his, out of his raft and walking, dragging along, his dra- raft, walking along the the bank of the river, dragging his raft, and I'm like, Trevor, get back in your raft. You, go, you, you like rode by me, and I hear you in the background. You're like, what the fuck's up, Huckleberry Finn? What are you doing out here? <laughs> I was like, oh, here we go, and I. The, that first night, he was so sunburned and stuff, and then he had the desert rats get into his crackers. I was like, this poor dude is going <laughs> to – he's he's in for a rough day. And you're, he was like, so we're, like, way past halfway. And you're like, uh, not not really. We're a little <clears throat> bit past halfway. Well, so we put in five hours the first day due to the winds and three and a half hours the second day. Yeah. And it was – so it was eight and a half hours. And that's we started I, as early as we could to beat the wind. Yeah, we got got going, man. It was a breeze in the morning. I was like, shit, is this how this whole thing could have been? This is so easy. It's just – it's just a – it's a it's a coin toss of what the winds are going to do. You know? Yeah. And you'd come around a, a corner and you'd have a tailwind pushing you and you'd come around the next corner as a headwind. You know, canyon winds shift like that. It's all crazy and different. So, mm. but yeah, dude, it was. It's always amazing watching Nathan because if you want to talk about somebody who just won't say no, it won't quit. Like this guy doesn't know what 
I can't means. And it just like, that's the good thing. It's also dangerous because you can put him on any mountain or any incline or any challenge and he just won't quit until he gets it done. Yeah, I've ne- I'm never not climbed a mountain. I don't know what it's like. If we would have went to Aconcagua and oh, spent that kind of money, you'd I would have probably died. made it. You'd have probably summited. Well, I would have died if or I didn't. Died going up. There's there. no like somebody's like, hey, this is eight grand. I'm like, you know what, eight thousand dollars is to me. Like, I, I will die. Well, the one I'll of the die problems, eight thousand dollars. One of the reasons my feet got so cold is because they said last minute, hey guys, instead of the six thousand meter boots, we need eight thousand meter boots, which are the same boots that they use on Everest. And so, but I, everyone else was from the UK and Nepal and I didn't get this freaking email. And so I brought my 6,000 meter boots, which I thought was good enough for an 18,000 foot mount, you know, like 20,000 feet ish, you know, no, turns out, nah, nah. Hard to walk up the tallest mountain in South America when you can't feel your feet. Yeah. It was bad news bears. You can have the rest of that if you want. I'm all right. Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah. I figured I'd, I got a little coffee in it. Yeah, yeah, a little. That's it's called branding whiskey. You just have her in the morning. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I would say I, I would like to wrap up by plugging myself a little bit and just saying like, I. Dark horse. Dark sky. Dark sky. Dark horse is a coffee shop in San Diego, so you're close. Um, let's just plug. Let's just plug you. Well, uh, okay. I have a hard time not plugging you, but I'll try. Sounds um, so cool. <laughs> sounds so yeah, dirty. I <laughs> uh, oh, I'll, pl- I'll plug you. Um, but yeah, I, I I'm working on this album as I talked about earlier. It's, uh, there's three Texas guys. The rest are all Wyoming guys. Uh, a lot of them are people you'll know. Um, Sam's gonna get me some stuff. Well, I, we haven't even talked about it completely yet. We're gonna. It's gonna be satellite, but we're but, gonna. Okay, yeah. Which I mean is what's happening with quite a few people. But um, I'm just really excited about this. I, I think that uh, Wyoming has a shitload of talent, and I think that a lot of people don't know it because a lot of people haven't marketed and marketed themselves well enough. And I think the headroom on a lot of these guys is pretty fucking wild. And I'm really excited about what I did with a a lot of them in just a span of 36, 48 hours and some phone calls. And I just hope that everybody will kind of tune in because it cost me 27 grand just to go to school. Rent in California isn't cheap. And I've flown all over the country also to do a little bit of it. And made a great friend in Jordan Crimston, and he has been a rock in this thing. I mean, uh, he's helped me out a ton. And uh, I really appreciate everybody with, like, Colton's song and Jordan's song already. Like, everybody's been sharing it a lot, and uh, that's just kind of what Wyoming is about. I feel a lot of Wyoming support. There's not a ton of people in California plugging my shit. So, Dude, you're going to, like, this, this, like you, you can't help but succeed with this. There's so much heart and soul in it and so much talent. This record is drenched in talent, and I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about everybody that Nathan hand-selected or asked to be on it. And then Nathan is so loved that everybody, nobody said no. No, not a single person said no. Yeah, and it's just like, this is gold. It's crazy, dude. Like, I, I was calling people... And by the time I got to, like, the second to last guy, he was like, what the fuck do you want me to do? And I just told him, he was like, cool, man, say that to other people. He's like, this should not take 15 minutes. And I was like, well, I just didn't think anybody would want to do it, so I had to justify it 87 different ways in, like, all these roundabout conversations (laughs) and finally bring it back to, like, so do you want to have a free vacation in San Diego and come to the weekend and eat donuts and shoot tequila and, like, maybe go to a dispensary and then I'll also take you to the biggest live room until you get to Hollywood and I'll record everything for free. And like, yeah, that's what the pitch should have been. Yeah, like that that's fast. exactly what it should like, have been. Like, so, man, like, how's your wife? How's your kid? Yeah, people in California suck. And, yeah, I, I, got, <laughs> I, got, it, I got it down by the, by the last one. But I, I really appreciate everybody saying yes. There are people, including Sam, that as a student, I legitimately have no – no reason to even be in the same room with a lot of these people. Uh, I have made some of my teachers extremely angry because they're like, they'll see a song they're like, well, I just saw this guy Spotify like you're this guy's gonna be on it. I'm like, yeah, hmm. and like been doing it for ten years and like I've never worked with a guy that big. I'm like, well, maybe you should fucking ask. I, I yeah, don't, I don't know. <laughs> you're clearly better at your job than I am. You're teaching the class, yeah. but like. It's, it's been made you get tested three times in two weeks for COVID. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, it's it's a uh, it's gonna happen again, so that's yeah. cool. But yeah, I I just hope people I hope people really like it. I'm I'm really excited for the group song. Uh, we got Jordan Smith's song coming out. The group song will come out last. I tried to shoot it a uh, music video for it this week. The smoke canceled it, but I met our uh, videographer. His name's John Balk, and he got out of a white creepy ass van threw this camel light on the ground and stomped it out has tattoos everywhere his ears are gauged his nose pierced on both sides and then his hair is shaved on the sides into a mohawk and he's like i was like this is my fucking guy yeah yeah let's rage. And we went out and i was like i was like well dude i was like the song oh one thing i do really want to talk about quick it, like the biggest dick swinging move that i've had in california is i'm recording a song about hanging Californian horse thieves that's probably going to get listened to more than any of the other songs because it has everybody on it because I'm trying to cater to the algorithm of Spotify. Can, so I, I'm be, like, can I be on it? Yeah, you're on it. I'm, okay. I want you to have a verse. All right. So, okay, yeah, we should talk more about <laughs> shit that's real instead of like, hey, have you heard the new Point North song? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, I was like, uh, it, like, I've been writing this song and Jordan has been gracious enough. He's like, doesn't care that I'm writing about hanging Californians, but I've, I've been in this insane studio talking about hanging Californian horse thieves, and I want to shoot the music video for it. Well, there's wildfires going on around here, and I talked to the guy, and it canceled it. But we went out to Kellen Smith's ranch. He's got a lot of land, and the guy was like, okay, this looks cool. And then he's like, I'm going to rent a video camera. It's Dude, it's like – it's it's something ins- – that's like 700 bucks a day to rent this lens. He was like, this will be – like Warner Brothers quality, oh, yeah. this music video will. He's like, we're gonna shoot it for a day, and I was like, he's like, we're getting a makeup girl out here. I was like, I don't have the money for that, and he's like, yeah, man. He's like, but I just saw this land, and he's like, all this shit just came to me. He was like, this is going in my resume. He's like, can I release it on my own YouTube channel? I was like, yeah, you're gonna do everything. He'll pay for the yeah, and he was like, he's like, I've got it. He's like, I'm covering the makeup. I'm not gonna charge you anything to shoot it. Uh, like Dude, I'll charge you a banger. little bit to edit it. He's a real estate photographer that's trapped in like graduations and weddings and stuff. But he's this like Dude, hardcore I want to come up here and shoot dude. Daisy. I want to shoot the, the music video for Daisy up here. Yeah, let's do it. Tell him let you do it. I yeah. know he would. But you got to be in it. Okay, yeah. I'll rob a bank. I, yeah. The only thing is, is now. Well, I don't want to give it away. I want to do a. I want to do a music video where like a place beyond the pines and like three ten to Yuma. Like ooh. Me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, We've got, I mean, we have some land like that, but. I don't have Ryan Gosling, but I have me. <laughs> that's yeah. just going to have to work. That's, you're, you're, <laughs> you're probably less better. of a liability at corner than he is anyways. Yeah, true it is. Um, but yeah, I, so I was talking to, I was talking to everybody. I'm like, I don't know who we're going to have be like the Californian horse thief. And everybody's like, you. I'm like, well, so now my YouTube search history is fucked. It's like, how do I hang myself without dying? <laughs> and so uh, I, I don't I don't really know how I'm going to do it. My parents are terrified. I can already tell you how and, you do yeah, it. Yeah, we're going to do it with a harness. So Yeah, it's you do it with a harness, and you attach the rope to the harness so that when it pulls down, it just slides down the harness just far enough. You use rubber mm-hmm. bands. Yeah, yeah. Can you actually shoot that as you're hanging down the Yeah, right. Yeah, it looks, oh it looks like I'm hanging myself on it. It's on, like a hundred on an air and opportunity trip. Yeah. People are like, I don't hate my demons that much. Yeah, this dude. is this is not 127 hours. This is 126 hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to to the grave. But I was Jesus. talking to this guy, and I was like, I was like, yeah, man. I was like, I was like, if somebody threw up, I wouldn't mind. Like, I was like, I want this to be dark. I was like, I was like, I have a lot of spite for this place that I've been for a while. I was like. I want it I want it to be nasty. And then we pulled up, but we were checking water with Kellen and he has a dam where his water tanks overflow. And the guy was like, can we drag you through the water? I was like, yeah. well, he's like, he's like, well, we're going to, he's like, we're going to catch you. We're going to drag you through the water. And he's like, I'm going to drag you to the base of that cottonwood, that lone cottonwood. And we'll hang you right there. He's like, Kellen's going to spit in your face. He's going to punch you. He's like, he's like, everybody's going to kick you in the stomach. And I was like, Kellen's like Kellen's just like Jesus <laughs> and I was like well I was down to get hung and I was honestly a little bit scared about that and I'm like these guys are gonna drag me on a horse and stuff and he's like he's like yeah man this is gonna hurt and I was like well let's make sure and get everything in one take then and then the worst part is with the with the light the way it is they're gonna hang me in the morning so it's like we have to shoot the rest of the video. I was wake like, up and get your fucking face fit in. Yeah, I was like, yeah, <laughs> Kellen choose too. He's like, Jesus. he's like, yeah, man, I'll spit right in your face. I was like, 
Okay, so, so that music video, that song is a song that everybody else has had final say on the record. I'm like, with your song, you do whatever you want. I have ideas. You're the artist. You can veto them whenever you want. That's how it works. But this is like, I got two dudes, two Wyoming dudes to write the song, Jordan Smith and Jordan Lisko. And I was like, hey, the the, yeah, I was like, the thing is, once I get this, you're done. Like, we have the guitar, we have the acoustic guitar part. I'll keep that. I won't change any of the words, but the instrumentation, the production, this is all me. And I'm making it, I'm making it like pretty this country. Is my world, grandma. Yeah. It's like a country metal punk bluegrass song. And, uh, There'll be nine dudes on it, so I'm I'm very excited, and it's called Ronin Rope. It'll be the last song that's out. Ronin it'll, Rope. Yeah, it'll Dude. feature it'll feature everybody. Um, like ro- like a roan pony. Yeah, nice. that's the horse that I steal. Nice. Yeah. So it's uh, there's if if you don't like Californians, which a lot of people in Wyoming don't, this music video is uh, right up your alley. So I do, do want to say we don't hate all Californians. We we just we're of a we're of a different mindset where. You know, don't California my Wyoming. There you go. That sort of thing. That's a good way to say it. Yeah, my mom sent me that shirt and I wear it sometimes. I make a ton of friends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm I'm pretty comfortable with that unless you have anything you want to ask us. And I mean, I'm I'm stoked that you let us do it. And I'm I'm really happy Sam happened to be driving by and I could flip him off while we were getting some coffee. Yeah, yeah. it worked out worked out pretty well. Do you want to wrap it up? Yeah, uh, where's uh, where do we where can we get the L Bar Seven apparel? Oh, okay. So um, I I already had like a thousand followers on Instagram through L Bar Seven Apparel, and I wanted to make it. I wanted to like kind of change into a production gig, so I changed it to it's just L Bar Seven Apparel and Productions on Instagram. Uh, it's linked on my personal just Nathan Kisk page. Um, and we're we're super high tech. You DM me and then Venmo me, and I'll ship it to you within a week. And uh, we got a girl in Casper named Kaylee who's doing it. And then if you're in Gillette, Wyoming, you can just DM me, and I'll get my buddy Derek Mallow. He'll he'll drop it to you. Banger. Sweet. Or you can come to the concert tonight for Sam. I'm peddling that shit uh, here and in Laramie. So it, I'd love to meet anybody and talk to them, but let them know what they're buying and what they're supporting. And uh, Hopefully they're comfortable with it. If they're not, they they tend to sell anyways. So yeah, absolutely. And I, I I've done this before, and I'll do it again all this week. We got two Wyoming shows. We love Wyoming. We love Nathan. Bring me, show me that you bought some 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 Nate dog uh, merch, and uh, we will kick uh, we'll kick a t- well, I don't say fifteen percent what we make off merch. We'll we'll throw it in the hat. All right. All right. Now you got to get this thing out in two hours. Yeah. <laughs> we can, we can do I will say, or or when we get back, you know, when we come back, yeah, to Wyoming, we can figure out a way to make it work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as far as L Bar Seven goes, man, we, we're huge fans, and obviously, huge fan of of you guys. Yeah, and we also A and L, Aaron Opportunity. You got to check that out, if, especially if you like want to book a trip. That's all the shit we've been talking about that I've been guinea pigged on, where you don't have to do the dumb part. Like, <laughs> yeah. he's he's got it all set up now. We got it all figured out. It. Yeah, all the kinks are out. So if you wanted to do that, how would you book a trip then? Yeah, you can go to aoadventureco.com. You can check that out there. Um, or it's, things are kind of crazy because I am sort of the ringleader and tour guide all in one. Uh, right now we're on the Dark Sky Tour, so we're not booking any trips at the moment. But you can definitely email me for some one-on-one stuff, um, uh, words of encouragement, and anything else you want to talk about. I'm always there. Um, and Utah, I, <clears throat> Texas, yeah, Utah, Louisiana. Texas. Yeah, I do uh, have a seaplane, so if you like to fly, uh, we can go fly in Austin. We can also go fish the barrier islands in Louisiana, catch some trouts and reds. Um, there, just basically, if you want to have some adventure in your life, aoadventureco.com. You can also email me at aoadventureco at gmail dot com. Sweet, perfect, cool. Looking forward to your show tonight. Yeah, man. Being on the show, guys. Yeah, yeah appreciate of course. you guys. It was a blast.